Hi everyone, my name is Corrine Perry and this is my final defense for MNR's 561's capstone project for Oregon State University. And this is to earn a master's in natural resources degree with an emphasis in geographic information systems. I have been in this program for about three years and the majority of this capstone work was completed in the last two quarters. And what you're gonna to see today is a combination of my previous master's degree in library science earned back in 2015, as well as my current work uh, through Oregon State. So if you see this theme uh, with library science throughout the presentation, please do not be surprised. Now in today's presentation, there's a lack of a host. So I'm gonna be taking on two roles. I'm gonna be the presenter as well as the host. So with these limitations, uh, I do ask that if you have any questions, if you could save them for the, for the end at the Q&A session, we should have enough time to answer all those questions then. The presentation will be about 45 minutes. Now, if you need to head out early or if your question is more urgent than waiting till the end, uh, if you could raise your hand, I'll try to get to that. And if I don't get a chance to, again, uh, I will get back to you. Maybe you can provide your contact information. I can follow up with you at a later time. But again, if it's urgent, I'll try to answer it at that, at that point. If not, I will, I will answer it at the end. All right, so before we begin, I wanna thank my primary faculty advisor, Demian Hummel, who gave me a lot of autonomy in this research process. And he was also very open about his feedback, and so it was a very open door policy in terms of being able to complete the work that was required for this degree. And also I'd like to thank the supporting committee members, Peter Vernon Nelson and Nicole Duplex, so this is a combined effort between the colleges of earth, ocean, and atmospheric sciences and fish and wildlife. Now, before we go into the study, I wanna talk about the title here. Now the word between is used rather than for or with, because what I found in the last year and a half of research on this, this uh, endangered species is that this animal is very contentious and this issue, these issues that, a dilemma that surround the animal do not seem to, to go away anytime soon. And it seems to be an ongoing concern. And there seems to be a rift between humans and wolves in order to achieve 100% coexistence. And so we seem to be finding these, these plans that work as well as possible. And before we go into what a constructive sustainability plan would look like, largely based on humans' needs and how they respond to wolves, I'd like to point out this quote here. Uh, it's, it's pulled out from the Summary of Public Comment in 2007 that discusses wolves' inherent right without any kind of constructive sustainability policy. So wolves, like other wildlife, have a right to exist in a wild state. This right is in no way related to their known value to mankind. Instead, it derives from the right of all living creatures to coexist as part of the natural ecosystem. <clears throat> and also in the chat box that you see over to the right, I wanted to mention that those are all the relevant links. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be referencing different past projects and links that are relevant and also taking you through a tutorial of some of the projects that I've done for this presentation. So that is your opportunity to follow along and even engage in some of these interactive uh, mini projects for the larger one. So they're all right there. And uh, again, if you have any questions about them, I'll answer them at the end, but all the links there will take you directly to the things I'm gonna show you in this presentation. <clears throat> so this project, this current focus, has been inspired by previous mini projects over this past year and a half. Now these past mini projects were the foundation and the background that helped uh, build this current, uh, this current project. And these are the ones that, uh, that were done in the past. So in the fall of 2018, you'll see in the bottom right hand corner here, was a vulnerability study I did on the, on the species, and this was for FW, and it was 583 Species Recovery Planning and Restoration. And the second project I did for Nicole Duplex's class, both of them were for Nicole Duplex's classes, was FW 563's Conservation Biology. It was focusing on, on gray wolves as a tropic cascade and how they're transformative for our planet. And the third study that I did was focused on wolves as uh, as a working relationship with birds. So it was a symbiotic relationship between the, between the two species. And this was done in the fall of 2019. So again, this leads into my current project. This provides foundational background for what you're gonna to see today. 
And the links are in the right hand corner if you want to take a look at the at the full project for each of these courses. It's in academia.edu. Now you need to log in in order to access them, but that's where they're located. <clears throat> So uh, why a long-term sustainability solution? Before we derive how we arrived at the final results and why we decided to focus on this, this angle, I'm gonna pull them out here for your reference so you can kind of see what we, what we concluded. And again, it's mostly picked this because we, we determined the order to, for a species to exist that's so problematic or contentious as this one, we need to come up with a plan that's gonna be a solution and workable for multiple people. And it involves different, different uh, individuals influencing this, this plan, but it needs to have uh, some, some, key, some key focuses because not everyone's gonna be satisfied in a finalized plan. And so it, it, it requires that it be written down and also discussed and, and negotiated between multiple players. But again, this is what we found is necessary for healthy coexistence between both species and to prevent wolf um, eradication. So the findings stated, that a long-term sustainability solution for this species depends on the human species ability to compromise its own unchecked growth and development in order to allow wild keystone species to live with the land. It depends on the human species ability to change their perspectives on wild species, thereby allowing them to live peacefully in an ecologically balanced manner. This is implementing deterrent strategies. Deterrent strategies could include anything from safer fencing around sheep enclosures where wolves arguably depredate on livestock, it could include less hunting, so maybe um, no bounty on hunting, and also less human encroachment on wolf land. So every time we, we build roads and develop into land that has known wolf packs, we cause a problem, and that's where you have the conflict between the two species. So less encroachment on land would be, would be ideal on wolf habitat. And then the human species ability to adapt to new norms and implement protection strategies that ensure planetary health and human health simultaneously. So now planetary health is something is a newer study and it focuses on the health of the planet. So doing things destructive like logging deep into the forest and finding animals that are carriers for things like COVID-19 and then eating those animals and spreading it to mass populations of people is an example, an indirect example of how uh, planetary health is not as good as it possibly could be. So if we were not doing those logging activities, and if we were not eating these, these species that are found deep in the wood, in the forest, then we might not have gotten COVID-19 uh, that we have today. But that's again, that's, that's open to discussion. That's another, that's another topic, but that's an example. And that's planetary health. And then of course we know what human health is. <clears throat> so another strategy would be wolves staying away from humans and livestock. Uh, this would also be a way for animals to uh, further adapt. So if they, they learn that they need to stay away from us and that'll help protect their numbers, that's an adaption strategy. And of course there are limitations here because we can't expect that wild species would entirely understand this at the same level that, that our civilization has developed to. <clears throat> but this would help. And then education on the importance of this keystone species. So education is key, you know, teaching people about the importance of these animals and why we should protect them. Those are things that would help. <clears throat> and these are videos here that were taken during tours at the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center. There was a feeding tour that I went on in November. So that's what you're seeing there. And then at the Grizzly Wolf and Wildlife Center in, uh, in Montana, this is, it's an open tour and this is what I saw in the winter when I went. So now we're gonna just go over a brief overview. Uh, this is what's gonna be covered today, and it shows how we concluded again at the before mentioned results and how we got there. So the presentation really has seven parts to it in total. The first part is this PowerPoint and presentation portion. The second part is the research report and literature review, which you see the link to in the right in the chat box. The third part is the ArcGIS informational data map with current gray wolf range. This is the, the GIS component. And also the ArcGIS story map, which is made through the classic model. Uh, this is, instead of tour cascade, we found that it was, it just conveyed the message and the purpose of this project a little bit more efficiently than perhaps the other two formats did. And then we go into the Qualtrics survey and SPSS results. This was the analysis portion. It's also uh, ties in my background with surveying. Then we have the long-term sustainability solution, again reiterated as we've already discussed. 
And then finally we have, I'm gonna, th I'm gonna thank any other partners and people that contributed to this project because I could not have done it without them. And then of course the Q&A section. So why wolves? Like why did I decide to, to study wolves for my capstone? It really began as a childhood interest. Back when I was a little kid, I used to read these books by David Clement Davis. He writes animal fantasy stories. And in one of the books that he writes about, it's called The Sight. And it looks at white and black wolves relationship in a family pack. And it follows them through a prophecy in the story. So it's kind of like the mythology part of uh, folklore of surrounding wolves. But it follows them through this, this journey and this process. And it talks about like the dynamics of the relationship between humans and wolves. And so that was, that was where it really started. Um, and then in the spring of 2018, I, had a, I, I lived temporarily in Kern County, California. And during this experience, I had a chance to go to the Wind Wolves Preserve. It's the largest nonprofit nature preserve on the West Coast. Well, during this experience, I read at the entrance, as you see here in the image here, I'm gonna do a laser pointer. As you see here, this image that says 1996 Wind Wolves Preserve, on that signage, it says more or less, are the wild, wind wolves are the wild grasses that resemble running animals. They embrace the spirit of extinct wolves and grizzly bears that once roamed these lands. Wind wolves sway in unison with the wind, making it appear as if animals are wandering through the prairies. Now in this experience, I had the notion that something was inherently missing. And so this is where I started off in this research process in the state of California, my home. And eventually I relocated to Boise, Idaho at the beginning of this year. But again, at the time that I was, this happened, this was two years ago, I felt like something was missing from these lands. It, it, it felt really, it, it seemed quiet. And something, again, was, it wasn't in quite, it just didn't seem quite right. But this is what inspired it. Little did I know at the time that it would do this, but that's what it did. And then in the fall of 2018, after that spring, in, in my 5W583 Species Recovery and Restoration course, I had a virtual conversation with some other students in a discussion post, and that's what basically solidified it. I decided, okay, I need to, I need to study the species. I wanna find out more about what's going on with them. Why are they such, uh, so much debate and why are they sub the subject of so much interest in our, in our country and uh, our interest in animals? So keystone species, these are all the things that I learned about them after I finally decided I, I wanted to focus on them is that there are keystone species. And from the Oxford languages, definition is one in which other species in an ecosystem largely depend, such that if it were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. They are fiercely loyal pack animals. There's arguably one breeding pair in a pack. We've heard, and many people have heard of this notion. And there are exceptions in larger, larger packs, packs in some places that have gone up to 20 to 35 individuals. So there's more room for more of them to breed, but in smaller packs and medium-sized packs, there's generally only one breeding pair. And it's because wolves decided at some point in their history that they wanted to regulate their own population numbers and they wanted to be able to have enough food to go around for all of their, all of their numbers. And so they decided to only have one breeding pair. And arguably the alpha could also be potentially the strongest in the pack, but it's mostly about the breeding pair. And in many cases, if the, if the breeding pair, if one of the mates is not killed, early or if they don't die of disease or something else, if they stay alive for a very long time, wolves have been known to stay with their same mate their entire life. So I like this concept. Again, they have a symbiotic relationship with birds. What happens is, is mostly it's ravens and, and magpies and even in some cases eagles. So scavenging birds, and I guess you have a raptor in there as well, but these smart scavenging birds are mostly the ones that have this working relationship with these, with these animals. And what it is is that sometimes birds will actually help wolves identify places where there's, there's viable prey for them to eat. So they'll circle overhead where there's a big you know, prey population that exists and wolves will know to go there. Or in other cases, the wolves will find the kill and the ravens follow them to that kill site. And the wolves open up the carcass, eat their, their parts and leave the remnants for the birds. So this is this working relationship that they often tolerate. So there's the biological makeup of wolves. There's this unique stare that these animals have. And to put it into an example, Aldo Leopold, a famous philosopher, is someone who was a wolf eradicator, someone that was in favor of eradication of the species at one point, and was turned conservationist when he had this experience looking at a wolf in the eyes that he had killed. He watched it die in front of him, and that's what inspired him to change his focus. So I'm gonna pull this out of the book, it's called Green Fire. It's a documentary about Aldo Leopold's life. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. And again, as he saw it 
dying, he felt inspired to change his focus. And that's what he did. Wolves are ancestors of dogs or considered man's best friend. They're a contentious animal. So I just, I have, for me, I have to ask why an animal is so contentious, what makes him the subject of so much debate. They are beautiful creatures. So arguably that's my opinion, but there's also many others that believe the same thing. And then there's the mythology, folklore, and misunderstandings surrounding them. This ties back into my childhood interest reading the site and also other things like hearing about them as werewolves. Basically, I think if, we, if they've earned the right to live on in legends and folklore, then I believe they have earned the right to be essential in the wild. So this is the literature review. In this literature review, and you can see the link to my final report, it's on the bottom, it's the last link in the chat box. You can take a look at these different sections there. It's, a, it's an 111 page paper. But the literature review covers the tropic cascade and keystone species difference in the animal, what those things mean. The tropic cascade basically means that when an animal's at the top of the food chain, it affects everything else down to the bottom of the vegetation level if it's removed from the food chain. So this talks more about that and as their keystone species. It talks about Yellowstone's, Colorado's, Idaho's, and international wolf plants are surrounding the species. What's interesting is that Oregon State University has been conducting a research on the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park recently that has resulted in what they found that willows have actually been healthier and living longer and taller in, in places in Yellowstone where the wolves have been reintroduced rather than before when they were not there. So basically the wolves are indirectly having an influence on the, the tree health of the willows in the park. Wolf monitoring. So wolf monitoring can be done by citizen scientists who just go out into the field and happen to observe a wolf and they report it to IDFW, which is Idaho Fish and Wildlife. Then they can document that as a citizen scientist finding. Or it could be done through management with radio collaring, tagging, cameras, etc. So this also covers conflict. Why are they so controversial? And covers things like about how wolves are a natural filtration system. Some people have heard this before, how they regulate large big game species of elk, deer, and moose, or these are considered ungulates. Basically, they go for the weakest in the pack or the unlucky ones, uh, keeping the rest of the herd stronger because they're weeding out the weaker in, in the pack to eat. And again, wolves have gotten a lot of, con they've gotten a lot of criticism because of this, because arguably some people say that the weakest means the youngest, but what wolves are really doing is they're not singling out some portion of the population all the time, what they're doing is they're going for the easiest one to kill. Because if they go for a strong prey animal, there's a possibility they could get hurt, they could get kicked, they could get, uh, I don't know, stabbed by one of the antlers of a deer. These things are bad things and wolves need to survive too. So they're going for one that they're, they're opportunistic hunters. So they're going for what's going to be the easiest kill. Perception. Wolves kill what they generally intend to eat while humans are known to kill more for pleasure. They do trophy hunting. So that's the difference between the two species. And that's what, why we need the wolves because they have a healthier way of killing in the prey populations and keeping it healthier and stronger. If we're killing the strongest in the pack, then we're essentially making the prey populations a lot weaker. Now, to pull out a portion from this, this section, humans' ability to deny its existence or remove itself from nature is one of the many reasons why they have betrayed wolves. Wolves are often viewed by humans as the epitome of what they have spent years civilizing themselves away from. This includes the canines' many characteristics from their howl to their, their family structure, to their hunting abilities, and to their ability to perceive the world around them. So domestication of the wolf has led to an infantile version of the adult wolf. And I would go as far as to say people actually feel threatened by their wildness and what it actually means, not just necessarily their teeth. <laughs> so coexistence. Continuing education is definitely something that will help us to understand the importance of the species and how we can achieve this existing coexistence or this coexistence and of course the idaho federal Re Re recovery plan of 1995 what their plans were to get the wolf back into the state why they did it and also the state response plan in 2002 that followed up after the wolves had already been there for a few years In order to arrive at the final results for the sustainability plan we reviewed already, I collected feedback from a diverse and wide array of people regarding their preference for gray wolf protection. There were restrictions in the total amount of data collected due to COVID-19 restrictions and IRB regulations. However, what was collected was substantial enough to derive results from and to suggest for a future study. Now, I'd also like to do a short activity before we go into the findings of this result. So I have a poll. I would like to show. Let's see. 
you guys see it? No, okay. All right, so here's the poll. There's three questions and it's completely anonymous and it's voluntary, so you don't have to feel the need to answer if you do not want to. But if you do, uh, if you, I'll just give you a few, a few seconds to answer this. Okay, and here are the results of this, this small poll, the short poll. Okay, so the purpose I'm gonna go back to the other screen. All right. So the purpose of showing you this briefly, okay, the purpose of showing this to you briefly is because this is how the informational data points were collected in the field. When I went out into Idaho and surrounding states and even countries, because I collected some points up in Canada, on this this wolf. And this is how the data points were largely collected, is by answering, asking those three questions that you just answered and getting results, deriving results as, as you see in the poll. So do you know much about wolves? Have you seen any wolves? And do you think wolves should be protected? The points were collected in a GPS essentials application for smartphones in KML format or manually inputted in Google Earth after the fact based on knowledge of where this event had happened. And the KML files were then converted into geo database layers in our catalog and then merged the data management tool and populate over a terrain map on ArcGIS 10.5.1. The result is what you see here that's a little bit faded in the background, but this is what ended up resulting from all those different points that were collected. And you can see all the different places that the re I went in order to collect these, this, this data. The majority was collected in person, so you can see where COVID-19 would, would very much influence this quarter's collection process. In fact, the majority of it was collected in the winter. I only got one point for spring due to COVID-19 restrictions. Now, in GIS, things are graphed through the raster or vector format. Vector models use points, lines, and points and lines, segments to identify locations on Earth, while the raster model uses a series of cells to represent locations on Earth. Vector was preferred because it could ideally coordinate information or identify coordinate information in specific locations and was more storage efficient than raster models. So we're going to go into the ArcGIS map, take a look at what is in it. And you have that link in the chat box. All right. So we're going to go into variable range. I'm going to show this. Now, if you want to, in, if you want to participate in this yourself, you, again, you can click in the link. It's the one here on the right that says ArcGIS terrain map with current gray wolf range layer. Share it. All right, so this is what we're seeing. So these, this is where it's, it's all published. It was published on ArcGIS, it was, it was created in ArcGIS 10.5.1 and then published as a, as a service layer onto the online, the online platform. And this is the resulting, uh, this is the result of that process. So on the, the left here, you have the legend. This is a consolidation or merge of all the different points that are collected between fall and winter. And then we have the one point collected during the spring. Now the green represents any respondents who are in favor of gray wolf protection. The yellow represents any respondents who were on neutral or unsure somewhere in the middle, or they just didn't want to respond. And red represents those who were not in favor of wolf protection for any number of reasons. So you'll see there's actually a majority of responses in the green and yellow sections or areas. So now if we go to the map, this map is actually very interactive and that was the purpose. I wanted it to tell a research story and to indicate that, if, that each point does actually have a purpose because there's additional layers inside each point that indicate what its purpose is in this process. So I'm gonna just click on a few here. For instance, this is, this is Modoc County. I went up to Modoc County and collected information. It was, it was a dual purpose. Many of these points were, but I was able to ask questions about wolves to different respondents. Now to protect their privacy, their names have been removed, but it does indicate here what that format was. So most of you'll say in person, it tells you a brief summary and the pop-up information here of what was actually collected from this respondent. You'll see the title information where it was collected. Symbol ID indicates where, uh, what, what number in the research process it was collected in. So this is the third data point along this trail. And then you can even see the beginning time. Some cases it tells you when this was either added 
or when it was actually collected. In some cases, it was collected straight through GP, uh, the GPS Essentials application. And then there's an additional layer. Uh, all of them have images or video clips of some or some kind of photo connected to this particular site or surrounding area. So I'm going to click on that. This is more information. It's going to, and you should be able to do this too. It'll take you to this album of what's relevant at this point when this research process started at this location. So this is Modoc County. You'll see some images. They have a lot of deer up there. The deer seem to have the right of way. Uh, this is what was seen inside the Modoc County Tax Assessor's Office. This is some history. So in some cases, you can click on these points and you'll actually see some historical information pertaining to it. In some cases, it's historical photographs that are collected from the archives in Idaho. Mostly they're for Idaho, but Sherman Library and Gardens Point also has some. And it's for that particular point or the area surrounding it. So it's kind of showing a, a, time, a time lapse of before and after, what the area looked like before and now what it looks like now. So here it is, here's the point. And if you click on each one, it actually gives you additional information. So here in the right-hand corner, you have an info, information description of what you're seeing. You have the photographic information here, the size, and you can download it and even, uh, you can even make comments. There's even a place to make comments. So this is relevant for every single point. You can click on every single point, and this is what it's gonna show. And so you can do this on your own time, it's interactive. The only other one I wanna emphasize is that there's one in rediscovered books. So some of them, if you see, they're all kind of collected in the same area. Up here in the, the, the top right-hand corner, it says one out of 21. So that means that uh, there's, they're all collected in general same radius area, and so they're all combined together. And so you can actually click on the arrow here on the right and scroll through it and to find the one that you're actually intent, you're, you're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for the one that's rediscovered books in Boise. So here it is. This is Rediscovered Books. It's a bookstore that's in downtown. What we're gonna do, my mouse is stuck, okay. So this gives you get different additional information. Again, it's collected 30th in the, in the research process. This is some of what the respondents said. Their own experience, this is when it was collected. So this is an actual example of when it was collected. It was on, uh, it collected on the 28th of, this, of, of March of this year. And when you click on more information, You'll see some historical photographs. These are collected from the Idaho State Archives. Kind of shows what the area looked like before. It looks like what it does now. And this is what it looks like now. So this is outside of Rediscovered Books in Boise downtown. This is me on the left here. And this picture is an image of the author, Roseanne Perry, who wrote this book, A Wolf Called Wander, that you see here. Now, this is an interesting book. Now, as you notice, Perry, it's the same last name as mine. There is no relation, but it's just, it's an it's ironic coincidence. She, this author was out in the area doing uh, a signing for this, this title, it's a children's book. Now this, this, this wolf is important because it's, it's OR7. It's the, the wolf named Journey who traveled thousands of miles down through Oregon into California. The first wolf to step foot into California in almost a hundred years since they were eradicated. So it was really, it was very important. It was a documented encounter. And so she follows the wolf, the life, the life of this wolf in this book, and it's directed towards children. So children are like sponges; they can collect a lot of information, and then they might be inspired to do something about it in the future. Just as my, the sight book was inspired me to focus on animals, maybe this book would inspire another child to focus on them into the future. So again, you can look at that in your own time. You have the link in the chat box, but these are all the points, and every one of them tells a story. And there's even one up here in Canada during my time when I went to Montreal. So we're going to go back and we're going to share. Okay. So I'm trying to slide. Okay. So these are the final results of that informational data study. What you see here are the results here in, in a pie chart format. So the majority of responses were in green. This was in favor of wolf protection. Somewhere in the middle was yellow, and then the, the least amount of responses was in the red category. Down here, it shows you in bar chart format, if that's more visually uh, appealing to you, it shows you the same information in bar chart format. And it also shows you how responsive the respondents were, or how willing they were to re respond to the survey. So yes was 
the people that were willing, and no was the people that were kind of on the sidelines, they didn't want to know more about what was going on. And then yes, no shows how many were collected with the GPS Essentials application, and also how many were just directly inputted on Google Earth. Now this is the next part of my presentation. It's the story map presentation, and you also have the link in the chat box. But I'm gonna go briefly through some of these sections in here, because this is a big part of the of the research. This was specifically requested by my main faculty advisor. He wanted to see all of this research put into a story map. So the before we go into what it looks like, I want to look. I want to point out that the title here to you. It has purpose. So Journey again relates to that 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 childhood book that we just saw, and the story of OR7 that traveled down from Oregon into California to find a mate essentially and try to start a new family. And Wolfland refers to Carter Niemer's memoir. Uh, he was a federal trapper who worked, worked for years in the field. He was responsible for being one of the people that helped reintroduce wolves into Yellowstone National Park and Central Idaho back in 1995-96. And it follows his life after he, when he worked for the state of Idaho as a trapper and also a conservationist for, for wolves. He's retired now, but he's written two books and that's one of them. And then of course, Gray. I, it's a gray wolf, even though the animal comes in multiple colors. It actually comes in white, gray, and brown in some cases, and mixtures of those. But it's rarely a white or black topic. If you talk about this animal, it's a rarely one or the other. I mean, it has a lot of mixed connotations in there. So hence, the gray is actually pretty relevant, as metaphorically speaking, for this animal because it's so, uh, it's so, it's so complex. It's not, it's not a, um, it's definitely a complex animal. If you follow that link through, we're going to go into the next portion of this presentation. Okay. So we're going to look at this. Okay, so this is what you're going to see. If you go to ArcGIS Online, like we just were for the, for the Gray Wolf Range map, this is what you're going to see. And if you have login credentials, it might be able to allow you to have more of an interactive experience, but I believe you should be able to access it from here too. What you're going to see is a description for what you're gonna see in the, in, the, in the story map. Go down, you see the terms of use, if there's any kind of restriction for this, this story map, in this case there is, for the data. Tags, these are related studies in the right here. So if you wanna click on other projects that are related to this one with the same keywords, you can click on these and it might take you to them. And then the credits, these are all the different contributing organizations that made this research possible. Again, this may not be exhaustive, but thank you so much for everyone that did help make this possible. And you click on view to take you into the presentation. So many of these images are my own. Unless it says otherwise, they were captured at different sites. This white wolf in the back is my favorite one. It was captured at the Grizzly and Gray Wolf Discovery Center when I went there in the winter of this year. And this wolf looked very peaceful and calm. And it just, it ended up being my favorite image that I captured. But as you go through the story map, it's all again in the, in, the, in the classic model. It's not, it's not a cascade or tour, because it's just, it, we felt that this got to the point and really conveyed the message. And here is a, a brief video I wanna show of wolves hunting strategies and how they work together as a pack to achieve this, 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 this killing objective. Okay, so what you're gonna see is that here's a, a pack of ungulates these are prey animals, and they were grazing in a certain area, and all of a sudden they notice that the wolves come in. This is a pack of wolves that do it strategically. It's led by the alpha male, um, and they go after, they try to weed out a weak animal in the prey population. They find one that's either tripped, it's injured, it's sick, uh, it's either went the wrong direction and just made a mistake, but they decide to, as opp opportunistic hunters, they go for the one that's gonna be easiest to catch. And that's the alpha that's leading the, leading the kill. And then they, they weaken it. Some come in from the side, some come in from up front, some go right for it. And there you see, they work together to weaken it, pull it down. And once it lands on the ground, that's when they have their catch. And you can see now they're slowing down because they realize they do. And once the rest of the, the ungulate prey population moves away from it, you know that it's, it's pretty much done. They've accomplished their objective. And there you go. That's an example of how a kill happens. You gotta keep saying opportunistic because they're not singling out species in the prey population. They're doing it because they're just hungry. I mean, got, uh, they were made as, as predators and they have to eat. And so this is how they do it. This is how they accomplish those objectives and they work together. And it's specifically called cursory predators. They make themselves known. Whereas in the difference between uh, uh, mountain lions who work alone 
and 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 bears who are more like scavengers when they they hunt for food or or mountain lions which are ambush predators that can actually jump on a on a prey and kill it in an instant wolves have to weaken their prey first before they can actually pull it down so hence cursory predators this is a food web. It shows how the wolf is at the top. It's a tropic, tropic level, tropic cascade effect. If you remove the wolf, you can see how it has this topple down effect all the way down to the base level and the vegetation species. This is the historic range for the gray wolf. This image was collected from the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center. It was during an educational feeding tour, so the credits go to them. But this shows what their historic range was. This is where wolves used to live in the lower 48 states and into Alaska and even going out as far as Hawaii. Now, they used to inhabit, as you see based on the, the blue area here, because gray wolves are also often considered timber wolf. It's often used interchangeably to, to identify the same animal. They were mostly throughout all of the states at one point or other. And now it's, it's changed quite a bit. If you remember the current range from the map we saw earlier, it's changed quite a bit over the years. So then what has happened? Why has that number gone down so much? In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the, the president of the United States and the government declared war, and the people declared war on predators. And it was a very destructive time period in our history. But here's the quote you can see that they, they considered the, it the beast of waste and destruction. So it was backed by the government to do this. And at one point, Killing wolves through any means possible was what they were trying to do. This is a funny meme that kind of shows what happened, its evolution over the years, but wolves are the distant ancestors of dogs. This is what they've become today. Anyways, this is what it looked like. So they were encouraged to kill wolves with any means possible, whether it be poisoning, trapping, snares, shooting them. In some cases, it was even as dramatic as being uh, tied to a rope and dragged behind a running horse until they tore apart. So anything, nothing was off limits. They could do anything they wanted to to kill these animals because they saw them as a problem species and they just wanted to do away with them. And this was all acceptable behavior. And they were offered bounty to do this. It was, they took pride in it. So you can see how some of these individuals are even smiling uh, for engaging in these practices. The war against wolves came to the new world as a virus in the mind of the first Europeans to settle North America. This is directly from Peter Steinhardt's The Company of Wolves. If, uh, if I recommend if you haven't had a chance to read up much on, on the, the history of wolves, this is a really good book. It's my adult inspired literature for this, this study. I read it to get a lot of background information on what's happened over the years. It's a great book and I thought it really does a great job of going into the story of what's happened to these species over the years. So again, if you get a chance, I highly recommend that book. And then of course there's the media. The media did nothing to dispel the myth of the wolf over the years. In fact, they made it worse by spreading things like this, like, like the, the evil of wolves through books and through, through movies. So we've all, so many of us grew up knowing the story of Little Red Riding Hood, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, and Three Little Pigs. These were spread through childhood stories. And when you're, you learn these things as a kid, it becomes ingrained in your mind. And so people start developing these notions that these animals were very, very violent, very evil, and that they had, that, they're, that they need to be, stay away from them. Like to the, to the point where they thought that these animals would come into their homes and, and kill, still steal their children and kill them in the middle of the night. And that's not necessarily, that's not the case. In fact, over the last 100 years, there's been minimal if not no documented kills of wolves on humans in the United States. So it's, it's largely a myth. These are werewolves. Of course, we've heard of this story about a wolf that, a person that transforms into a wolf at night and is very barbaric and demonic. Again, these are stories. It was all made up. It was fan fiction. I mean, it was circulated like wildfire, but it did a lot of damage and dis disservice to the animal itself. And it continued on until about 1966 when the government began recognizing the error of their ways and implemented the Endangered Species Act, which started protecting these species. And now protection largely depends on regulations that require them to be protected. So this does make a big, this does make a big difference in the recovery process for endangered species. So wolf dogs. Wolf dogs are, are the current example of humans' influence on the species. People think it's cool to breed a wolf and a dog. It often happens between, in the wild, it often happens between a, a wild female and a male dog. Uh, and it's mostly because the female cannot find any males of her own species. So she, she mates with a dog. And when it happens on purpose, it's actually a huge problem because people think it's cool. But again, once the animal reaches about the age of two, their, uh, their 
wild nature starts coming out and many people can't deal with it at that point. And so what happens is, is that when these animals are released into the wild because people don't want to take care of them anymore and there's no space for them in different captive facilities, these wolf dogs are often clashed with the real wild dogs. And some argue that they're actually more dangerous and more aggressive than the actual wild wolves who have learned to adapt and stay away from humans over time. Because wolf dogs will stay around livestock areas and they have a clash between the civilized and wild going on in their mind. Whereas the wild wolf is completely wild and a domesticated dog is arguably completely domesticated, these animals are somewhere in the middle. They're hybrids and they don't know where they really belong. And so that clash between civilized and wild causes them to go crazy. And that is why sometimes they're arguably more aggressive and they're often the cause of <clears throat> livestock depredation, but when it comes down to uh, assessing blame and giving it to one of the animals, <clears throat> wolf dogs are all mixed in with the same wild wolves, and so it all ends up becoming a wolf problem. And so again, wolf dogs are really not that, that great of a thing in, this, in, in, the, in today's civilized world. So the real wolf. The real wolf is actually what we've seen before. They're fiercely loyal. Uh, because of what we've conditioned them for over the years, they've learned to stay away from people. So they're actually not that violent and they're not that dangerous because they've learned to adapt and they're intelligent species. So they've learned to stay away from us. That keeps them alive. They monitor their food rations. So they actually have one breeding pair so they don't overpopulate. They can feed everybody. They've been the companionship of us. In fact, at one point they decided to be our companion and to the point where we evolved them into domesticated dogs. They've been misunderstood, so again, they're often blamed for livestock depredation, when in fact, it could actually be the, the, the ranch manager's lack of management. They could be practicing better practices, maybe deterrent strategies, putting flagry, uh, uh, flagry fencing up, which actually deters wolves away, um, based on different studies that have found that it actually helps keep the wolves away from a particular pen or enclosure. Hunters who want to go out and trophy hunt and see the wolves as their competition, that is not justifiable natural cause for why we should get rid of wolves because hunters are going out there to, to hunt for their own pleasure. And if they don't eat the animal, then they're killing wolves essentially for no reason because they just see them as competition for their own big game hunting. And then of course, there's just controversy. Some people just don't like the animals, but that's not fair because these animals really have not given us reason since documenting deaths by wolves over the last hundred years, again, is few if not completely non-existent. So here's an example of another video. It's a short clip on wolf packs and interacting with their family members. You can watch this in your own time, but it shows how they're, they're, they're very in loving and they actually protect themselves and stay together. And it's a very endearing kind of video to watch and concept. I mean, in fact, many humans may, may learn something from that, is that they stay together and it keeps them stronger as a pack. When they do when their packs are broken up that's what makes them weaker so lone wolves lone wolves are those who either get driven out from their pack or they go searching for another family and this is an example of, of takaya she, he's a famous lone wolf that uh, went off on his own swam across the ocean onto this island off of british columbia and survived there for many years on his own waiting for a mate who never came unfortunately but if you want to learn more about the story of this famous lone wolf, here's links to it. They'll take you to it. Uh, but basically, that's what they are. There are people, there are wolves that are mostly looking for their own family. So reintroduction, this goes into what we have been discussing before. But wolves were reintroduced into central Idaho and Yellowstone National Park back in 1995 as one of the greatest, uh, the greatest reintroduction efforts ever in endangered species history. Now, what it was is they were classified as non-essential experimental species so that uh, the authorities could still manage them. That was a key part to the compromise to achieve this, but people started doing studies and realizing that something was inherently missing, and they decided that they wanted to bring this species back and to fix what was missing, and that's what they did. And this was despite controversy and any, any disagreement with the people that were already living in, in these areas. They brought them back for the science because they saw the benefit of having these animals back in the area. The wolves were brought down from Canada and reintroduced into the area. It was a hard release in central Idaho, which meant that they didn't have a temporary acclimation period. They were captured and released right away into central Idaho. In Yellowstone National Park, it was considered a soft release because they were captured, put into a pen temporarily. It was called Rose Creek Pen, and then released into the wild at that point, once they had adapted to their area. And it was also to remove memory. They wanted to keep them in for about three months to, so that they wouldn't go back to their home in Canada. 
And this is central Idaho. This is heading towards the Boise National Forest. This is an image over the old toll road area. And this is Yellowstone National Park. So the coexistence study, this goes into, again, what we, what we focused on before. This is the informational interviews portion. It's the same map that we saw earlier. Those are the points. And the green, the green up here is the, is the current gray wolf range. Again, this is in contrast to what you saw before as the historic range. So you can see where wolves have experienced the large misfortune because they used to inhabit most of the lower 48 states. And now they're only in the green areas that you see in mostly in Canada. And Canada is arguably one of the best places for wolves to exist now, because even though they have limited, if non-existent, uh, protection policies implemented up there, there's just so many places for wolves to exist with few humans that it's just a good place for them to live because there's just so much open space for them. So arguably, Canada is one of the best places for, for wild gray wolves these days. These are the results again. Now, this is the second part that I want to focus on, the, 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 more of the analysis portion. This was a survey. It was a mixed mode survey that was administered. It was open on uh, the 20th of February and closed on May 24th. Now, this was specifically directed to professionals that already knew more about the issue. They wanted more of a, a more extensive background on what people thought about this species in comparison to the informational interviews where anybody could contribute if they had something to say about the wolf. This was more geared towards people that really knew about the issue already. So these are the results of what was found. Let's see, I want to make sure it's still being shared right. Yep, it is. Okay. All right, so the first question, there was 15 questions in total. This was, do you live in the state of Idaho as your primary residence? Yes is on top, no is on the bottom. What is your age? It was generally in, in, in the adult range. Now, we didn't necessarily purposely exclude kids. It was just that we found that the results were more substantial at the adult level because they had already had time researching this animal. So again, that was the reason why kids did not respond. It was because this was geared towards professionals that already had knowledge of this issue. And they've worked with the species. That was ideally what we were looking for. Okay, did you know that Idaho Fish and Game managed gray wolves in Idaho? Yes, it's on top, no, it's on the bottom. This is the first uh, inf important question because it was correlated later. Do you think that gray wolves should be protected in Idaho? Yes is on top, and then you have, I do not know on the bottom, no. So this, is, this was the first uh, important question that I'm gonna pull out later. Uh, do you know much about gray wolves? Those different uh, experience levels. Have you seen any gray wolves? Do you consider yourself a hunter? No is on the bottom, yes is on top. How much do you support the current gray wolf hunting regulations set by Idaho Fish and Game? This was actually a surprise to me because it strongly disagrees on the bottom here. That's the largest number of responses. I didn't know what to expect from this question, but it seems that most people actually are against the current hunting regulations that are so open right now in the state of Idaho. Do you consider yourself a conservationist? Yes is on top, no is on the bottom. And to make another comment about hunting. Now, I don't know if people don't know this, but hunters actually bring in a lot of money for fishing game because they buy hunting tags and hunting licenses. And that generates a lot of income. And so that's part of where this is coming from. Whether or not personally their opinions may be any certain way for wolves, they're opening up the hunting regulation season because it brings in more money because hunters are providing a lot of income into the economic aspect of IDFW's management structure. Okay, do gray wolves as keystone species in a biological ecosystem change your view of them? Now, the next three questions were focused mostly on on people's preference and how they thought about the species. I wanted to find out is if they saw them in a certain way in this certain image, if it would change their, per their perspective on them. So this as in biological ecosystem influencers, as tropic cascades, if, if wolves as a biological ecosystem influence, um, would that change their perspective on them? So yes was on top, no was on the bottom. As family pack animals, did that have an influence? Did it, did it, did it matter that they were good family animals? And did the fact that they work together with other species as in a symbiotic relationship change their view of them as in working with birds? And this was yes on the top, no on the bottom. How important do you think it is to create a long-term sustainability management plan for wolves in Idaho? And again, this was the next important question that I asked. I correlated this with the question four later on in the analysis process. And you'll see very important on top and somewhat important underneath and the other ones are left blank. Okay, so now that we saw the initial results of the survey, once it closed on the 24th, these are the results of the correlation analysis that was done. So I took all the results and I, I, I put them into uh, SPSS and analyzed the results through correlation. I did a, an, a bivariate piercing correlation, which basically 
resulted in about 160 results. And I had lots of different results, uh, varied in, in, in the degree of significance. But what was most important to me were these, these two variables and their significance. So again, this is question four, do you think that gray wolves should be protected and how important do you think creating a long-term sustainability plan is for wolves? So what I found is, and what I'm gonna explain here what you're seeing, is that this was actually a strong correlation. And you can tell because in the Pearson correlation area that you see here, there's two little stars up in the right-hand corner here, two little asterisks next to 0 0.806. And that means, that means it's a strong correlation based on the 0 0.01 level. And that's less, that's close to zero. So that's pretty good, uh, two-tailed. And so what you're looking for are those two stars, those two asterisks. Because the closer this number is to positive one, the better re the relationship is between the two variables. The closer this is to zero, the weaker the relationship. And it goes the opposite direction too. It could be a negative correlation. It could be closer to negative one, meaning it's, a, it's an opposite directed uh, relationship, but it's still pretty strong. So this is the most ideal situation. It's, it's a positive correlation and it's 0 0.806 and it's two asterisks. So there's, a, there's definitely a significant relationship between these two variables. So after I found this out, I used the linear regression and I plotted, I plotted the two on the two different lines. So on the x-axis, we have the explanatory variable. Do you think that gray wolves should be protected in Idaho? And on the left-hand side, the y-axis, we have the response variable. That's how important do you think it is to create a long-term sustainability plan. Now, I used the linear regression because I was looking for something that was continuous. That I'm arguing, other than like the, in comparison to a logistical correlation, I'm arguing that this is a continuous result, that even though I was restricted based on COVID-19 and some other restrictions on how much I could collect in terms of data points, people are out there to respond. So the more responses you get, the more continuous the results are gonna be. And the more you're gonna get results coming in to influence this, this, this analysis and to make it just stronger. Uh, so also, I'm not trying to predict anything here. There's no max threshold or max limit towards in terms of how much can be collected. They're not binary num um, variables. I'm not arguing that these are distinct from each other or discrete. I'm arguing that there actually is a relationship. So these are all the reasons why I chose a linear regression. Now, I'm going to explain what you're seeing here. Basically, what this does, a linear regression, what it does is it takes all the data points that are related to those two variables and puts them onto a scatter plot graph. That's what this is called. It's a scatter plot. It's not a scatter. I mean, there's not as many as you might see in some others, but this is an example of a scatter plot. And then what it's doing is it's trying to find the line of best fit. The one, this line through the middle that goes to the middle as well as possible. The one that tries to uh, connect the points together as close to possible, as close to possible to the line. And then it gives you a value. This R2 value up in the right-hand corner here is 0 0.650. You want to get it as close to one as possible. The closer it is to one, the stronger the relationship is, the stronger the correlation. And so basically what we're finding here is that 0 0.650 is not too bad. That's actually pretty good. Again, it's suggesting there's a relationship here. And uh, we can actually call the line the 100% place of, exact, of a complete coexistence between humans and gray wolves. And so essentially what you're seeing here is that the more the people think that wolves should be protected, the more they move along this x-axis line, the more they think it's important to create a long-term sustainability plan for them. So again, there's a relationship. The strength in the relationship between the explanatory variable and the response variable is based on this linear regression model. And I'm saying the explanatory variables on the x-axis, it's the one that is essentially as independent as possible. And the response variable is the one that's affected or influenced by the explanatory variable. So we're gonna go back to the presentation to go over more of the conclusion here, but I'm gonna just discuss this quote. Wilderness without animals is dead. Animals without wilderness are a closed book. Again, that's from the Peter Steinhardt's The Company of Wolves. So essentially, we're arguing that these species are essential and then we wanna keep them in our, in, in our planet. We don't wanna remove them completely because it's gonna cause problems if we do. I'm going to go back to the presentation and compare the slides. Okay. So this is a summary again of the results that we just saw. In case you didn't get a chance to see them. And here is the conclusion. So this goes back into what we had discussed in the beginning. This is a long-term sustainability solution that we came up with. These are the points pulled out again. So you can see them before they weren't written down, but now you can actually see them here. So I'm going to go over them again briefly but we found that we need to do something about our own behavior. Uh, this compromise in terms of unchecked growth and development, this is a population control strategy. And I'm actually arguing that if we limit our population growth, 
it would reduce the amount of encroachment we have on, on wolf habitat land. And not just for wolves, it's for other species too. I'm arguing that, that we're rapidly expanding our population too much. And the more we do that, the more we're creating imbalance in the ecosystem. So if we can curve, kind of cull back our own numbers, there actually is more hope for these wild species. The human species ability to change your perspectives on wild species are by allowing them to live peacefully. As in, you know, not hating them just because they're a wild animal. Uh, it's not their fault that they're predators. Implementing deterrent strategies, again, like better fencing, no more trophy hunting of these species. And again, limiting the amount of roads and, and, and structures that are built in wolf habitat areas. The human species ability to adapt to new norms and implement protection strategies. Wolf staying away from humans and livestock. And again, education. So just educating people on the importance of why we should care about these animals. And finally, with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. I want to thank all these different organizations and contributors. It was not possible to com complete this project without their contribution. And again, this, this is by no means exhaustive. There is lots of different people and organizations that contributed to this process. And so with that, as I mentioned before, uh, I, I can now answer your questions. I'm going to open up for Q&A. So thank you so much. And if you have other questions that you, you want answered or see any of the presentations or anything, I can, you can send me an email. This is my contact information. Thank you.